that as well, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you. So who, again, received some great insight yesterday regarding social media? I know for me it was very powerful. I know that, you know, just thinking about the young people whom we serve and just how they're living in, I know for me, living in a different world um, where social media is in front of them and they have access to a whole nother world in a sense. So we're gonna continue that dialogue and Dr. Angela Garrell, who is our center's associate research scholar for evaluation and she's new with us this year. Um, she's going to continue um, to just provide us with more insight, but I also know that today she's also gonna have us interact a little bit more um, as we think about what that means in the work that we're doing, and even for ourselves as youth leaders, pastors, advocates, and the list goes on whatever role you're playing. So I'm going to stop here, and I want to welcome her back. I mean, she's wearing her glasses. Remember yesterday? <laughs> so help, welcome, help, join me in welcoming Dr. Angela Garrell as we go into our second session of social media. Um, so yes, can you hear me? We didn't do a mic check, but it's all good? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, yes, tonight I can see you much better, which is amazing. Um, and you're still beautiful, so don't worry. Um, they were actually in the bottom of my bag that I have on the floor here, right behind me all night long last night. Isn't that special? Okay, so um, as you can see, tonight is all about thinking outside the box. Thinking about youth ministry in new ways. Um, but I want to start with asking you, you know, you've had 24 hours to think about what we talked about last night. For those of you who were able to be present with us, um, do you have any questions? Um, I may not be able to take everyone's questions, but if you have a question that you would like um, to ask, then we could, I don't, the handheld um, is right here. And um, we could bring you the handheld. And don't make them too hard. Um, you know, and if I, you know, I, sometimes I can answer stuff and sometimes I can't. Sometimes I'll say, you know what, I need to think about that more. Let me email you later, um, which is actually a great thing for when you're, you know, a person working with youth too. You can always say, you know what, I really want to think about that more. Let me email you later or let me call you or something. Yes. And you're Marcos? Yes. Is that right? Yes, we met last night. Hi, thank you. Um, my question was, um, I work in the middle school with young people. And what are your thoughts on them wanting to follow me on Facebook or Instagram? Not that I'm really that popular. And they're young people. I don't know how the faculty would think if they're my friend on Facebook, but also it'd be a good way to witness to them yeah. as far as just what I'm doing in the school. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I would say that first um, I would ask how uh, comfortable your school is, if it has any policies about that. So any institution or organization that you work for may have parameters already in place around social media. So you want to check with the people who are above you first. You know, do we have any rules about whether teachers can have student, you know, have a relationship with students online? Um, and they might say no, especially in a public school system, because they don't want you private messaging students or them doing that, you know. Um, so there, check with them first. Secondly, I would say how comfortable are you with, you know, sharing your personal information, your perspectives with the youth that you work with? And so um, for me, for example, um, my Twitter and my, uh, my Twitter account is very public. It's very, it's for business stuff. It's kind of it's who I am as a researcher. Um, my Facebook account is like more private to me. Um, but still, I will add pretty, you know, I add a lot of people on my Facebook, but then Twitter, I mean, uh, Instagram is, is very personal to me. So it really depends, like sometimes you'll have different accounts and you'll say, you could follow me here, you know, but I don't want, you know, and then the other thing that you can do um, to kind of have parameters on your accounts for how you use them with people, and you can talk to teens about this too. Um, and then the other thing that you can do is you can say, when you get to, when we're done with our year together, or however long we're working together, then you can follow me. Um, but it really depends um, how much you share there. I would be, I would be cautious about um, definitely how much you allow youth to private message you if you work in a school or in a nonprofit organization. A church, um, I think you can be a lot more, like have, you know, closer relationships with youth and it not be questioned as much, but helpful, yeah. Yes. You know, could I just add a oh, yes. safe church concern? Uh, we were running a very large youth group, 250 kids in high school, and 11 team leaders 
we didn't really, th we thought we were creating too much of a risk of relationships that began to move in the wrong direction if the high school kids were on personal Facebook accounts with supervisors. But we could create team Facebook pages, right? Then on those, and each team Facebook page had to be monitored by the ministers. So it kept a certain level of control that they could engage on social media, but only in a monitored way. Something to consider. Mm -hmm. And we had a woman right here that raised her hand. Uh, I uh, recently had an interview and was told um, by my prospective employer that now in Connecticut they check social media for all jobs working with children. So if you have something to hide, don't put it on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Because they will be checking and, and you, you know, it depends whether you get the job or not. Yeah. If you tell them, no, you can't look at it or I only have Facebook or I just have this, but you have to tell them all of them and they go through from one to the other and they look for you and to see what kinds of things politically uh, criminally, uh, you name it, they look for it. If they find it, they don't think you're worth, you know, the possibility of having issues with you, then they are going to say, no, you can't have the job. Yeah. So Thank I just wanted so to much. let you know that was new. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this woman and then the woman behind you. Yeah. Angela, I'm curious how you might handle situations of conflict that occur among youth on Facebook and also criticism of others. I know, uh, I think of the principles in, that Jesus stated in Matthew 18 about how to handle a difference with a brother or sister. Um, and I know I see a lot of things on Facebook that would seem to ha be harmful to others and to our reputation and testimony as Christians. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's, you know, if we think about, um, you can hand the microphone there. Um, I think when we think about, thank you for your question. Um, when we think about social media, like I was saying last night, we want to think about it like the football field, like the movie theater or the mall. And so we always we have to use discretion. You know, how often do I go to this student and say, because we don't want to give them the impression that I'm watching you every second, um, or that I'm making, you know, holding you accountable to something that you haven't actually given me permission in my life, in your life, to hold you accountable to. You know, and so I think it's about the relationship you have with that student. Um, there are some students in ministry that if they they've said stuff on um, in a post, certain pictures or something, I feel very comfortable saying like you know, what was this? Why did you say this? Or, you know, I saw this going on between you and this other, this other person, and that was, uh, you know, I was, I was surprised by that, by what you said there or something, because I had a, a really comfortable relationship with that student. I felt like I could, to, could ask them about it, and we could have, a, you know, a conversation where they could reflect on, on what happened there. Um, and then there are other students that have said stuff, and I felt like, you know, um, it's not my place in this, with this particular student to say something. So I think it's just about using discretion when to say something, when not, depending on the relationship you have with that student. Thank you. Oh. Hi, I was wondering um, if there are any resources available for students who uh, seem to have kind of an unhealthy dependence on their technology to the point where they're starting to panic if they're not answering people immediately? Um, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit tonight about unhealthy use of social media, like the predictors of unhealthy use. And, um, but as far as resources, that is something that I actually have to think about. Um, you know, it is, it's, such, it's such a new phenomenon, even um, that we don't have a lot of research about how addictive media is. And when we use that word, we want to be really careful. We're going to talk about that tonight um, in relationship to media and teens. Um, but I think a lot of what we were talking about last night, getting teens talking about their experiences and then being able to um, create parameters around silence, around uh, you know, disconnection at times in their lives, like you know, teaching them to create space, just like you would with a car. You teach them how to use it. I think we really have to help youth and ourselves because it's such a new technology to say, 
when do we walk away from this? You know, but I think the more we talk with, with youth about it and set up um, parameters around it, the more that they will have a healthy relationship with technology. As far as what to do when a teen already has an unhealthy relationship with it, um, that would, you know, I could give you, uh, we could email about that. If you'll, if you'll email me, Angela.Gorel Angela at Yale.edu, then if I can find something, I will about that, yeah. And then we're gonna take this, um, this woman's question in the red, yes. Hi, um, at what age do you think it's appropriate uh, for the youth to start using social media? Um, you know, I think on Facebook, does it, there's a rule 13, I think, 12, 13. Um, for me, yeah, I think that that's probably a good age. I think 13 is, is an okay age to sit with, you know, maybe sixth grade. Um, sixth, seventh grade is 13, right? Yeah. Usually they, they, they turn 13. You're 12 in sixth grade and 13 in seventh grade. Um, so, ish. I'm sorry? 11th grade? Sixth grade is 11 and 12. 11 seventh 12. grade yeah, is 12 I guess it and 13. on your birthday, but um, so uh, 13, I think 13 is a good age to introduce youth to media and its parameters, but like I was saying last night, to really walk with them initially, maybe start with one account, um, you know, so 13 ish. Um, start with one account, um, ask them to show you if they know how to use it, help them to use it if they don't. Um, at, you know, have questions, you know, about safety, about, um, you know, all the things that you would want them to consider when they're online. Um, maybe have, you know, pretty strict parameters about how long they use it and, you know, maybe starting just like I said with one account and then adding stuff later. Um, and so, and watching them use it initially um, and then monitoring it is the next step and then eventually, you know, 14, 15, 16, I mean, sorry, 15 or 16, um, than allowing them to use it on their own, but having regular conversations with them about it. I think we had a question on this side of the room. Did we have? No? Okay. I think um, we will we'll get started now. Is that okay? All right. We're going to get started with our, our conversations tonight. Thank you so much for your questions. You can always email me, Angela.Gorel at Yale.edu, or tweet me, Angela, at Angela Gorel. Um, Questions? Did you have questions? <laughs> I think we covered that. Um, and we're gonna.
Let us pray. Dear God, as Trey McLaughlin and the guys singing with him have said, um, we want to be where you are, God. We want to see you. And while all that we do, all of our work with youth, the relationships that we have in our daily lives, our social media accounts, we submit all of it to you. And, that, and we, we want to say tonight, God, that we want to do everything in our lives for your glory. And so we commit this time to you so that we would learn more about what it is to participate in what you are doing. In Jesus' name, amen. So that's Trey McLaughlin and the sounds of Zamar. You can find them on YouTube. Um, Trey, it's awesome. They're, they're a choir, everything. Um, and it was so funny. I was sh uh, sharing with Sarah that I was going to share Trey. They come from Hotlanta. And uh, I was like, uh, you know, I'm going to share this guy's clip. You know, it's like, you know, just to open up the night. Like, you know, have you heard of him? He's so great. He, she's like, my husband and him are friends. I'm like, what? <laughs> And what's crazy is that my husband Paul and I love Trey's voice so much. Like his voice is ridiculous that we almost like flew him to LA for our wedding in our San Diego is where we got married. Um, but it didn't work out with the budget. But we really that's how much we had love for Trey. So um, if someone in this room has the gift of music and a voice and you'd be willing to open us up in song tomorrow night or another night, We'd be honored, so um, you could talk to Sarah or I at a break or at the end of the night, and um, we'd love for someone to open us up. We know somebody's got a voice in here. Right I know here. somebody does. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Calling out people. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Calling you out. Okay. I got, I got my eye on you. All right, we also, we want to be sure to point out that um, the little flash drives that you received, um, you know, they do have a lot of resources on them, great books and um, for working with youth uh, related to social media, all the issues that we're talking about this week. So Sarah and I tried to really compile the best of the best um, to, you know, to give to you on those flash drives and then also some titles of books, et cetera. So um, additionally, the Yale Youth Ministry Institute, uh, we're really committed to moving this conversation from just information, which you're getting a lot of information this week, a lot of content, but we're committed to moving it from information and content to a curriculum um, around joy, um, you know, and working with youth. And so, you know, a module that you could actually just input like with series around the issues that we're speaking about and in the future will be. And so we're working hard to, to create that curriculum in the coming months um, and to make it available to you so that you don't have to dream up how to sit and talk with youth about youth ministry, uh, about social media. We'll actually give you ways to have that conversation, you know, like do this, do that, do this with the, the, the ways that it, it works and stuff like that step by step and everything. And so if you have something that you feel like put this into the curriculum around joy, inhibitors of joy or cultivators of joy. If you have feedback for us, and you know, I especially would like help with this, um, or you think, you know, this should go in there, you have your own creative ideas, we wanna hear from you. And so we might even be hitting you up, like some of your churches in the coming months and years, and saying, would you test this curriculum in your youth group and tell us how it goes? <laughs> um, you know, so uh, we wanna partner with you in that, and we're so grateful for that. Last night, we discussed what social media is. Does anybody remember, what is social media? Spreading Yeah, it spreads information, and it connects. connects people. That's right, boom, you remembered, that's great. So all social media, um, there are current forms of social media, but social media goes way, way back, you know, even to the New Testament letters and so on, because social media is any media that connects people and spreads information. And so um, last night I promised to talk about addiction and media. Um, I hear a lot of teens actually um, say something like, I feel addicted to my phone. And I hear a lot of adults saying stuff like, teenagers are addicted to social media. Um, but in the, in the introduction to her book, Dana Boyd, um, she, it's, her book is called It's Complicated, The Social Lives of Network Teens, and I commend it to you. It's an excellent, excellent look at, at teenagers and social media. She says, most teens are not compelled by gadgetry as such. They are compelled by friendship. The gadgets are interesting to them primarily as a means to a social end. In fact, her research has led her to believe most of those who are addicted to their phones or computers are actually focused on staying connected to friends in a culture where getting together in person 
is highly constrained. She goes on to explain that many American teens have limited geographic freedom, less free time, and more rules. In many communities across the US, the era of being able to run around after school as long as you are home by dark is over. Many teens are stuck at home until they are old enough to drive themselves. For younger teens, getting together with friends after school depends on cooperative parents with flexible schedules who are willing to, drive, to be able to drive them around, which is very hard for parents that are working really hard. Um, socializing is also more homebound then. Often teens meet in each other's homes rather than in public spaces. And it's no wonder, she says, because increasing regulation means that there aren't as many public spaces for teens to gather either. The mall, which used to be a main hub for teens to gather at, um, is privately owned. And um, even now, propri proprietors can prohibit anyone they wish from coming, you know, from gathering at the mall. And many of them have prohibited groups of teenagers from gathering at the mall. In addition, parents are less willing to allow their children to hang out in malls and other public spaces alone. Um, they're more fearful of letting their teens be in these spaces, I think, together. Um, there's just more fear around teens being alone. Um, and especially out of the fear of strangers that they may encounter. Um, and uh, <laughs> teens simply have then far fewer places to gather together in public than they once did. And the success of social media, Dana Boyd argues, must be understood partly in relationship to this shrinking of public spaces. Facebook, Twitter, and MySpace are not only new public spaces, they are in many cases the only public spaces in which teens can easily congregate with large groups of their peers. More significantly, teens can gather in them while still being physically stuck at home. So for many teens, it just, it, it's the option that they have. If I want to connect with friends, given my busy schedule, given the extraordinary amount of homework that's given today, given the rules that I have, given how hard my parents work and they can't take me around or I can't afford a car, et cetera, you know, this is where I can hang out with my friends. Um, Mark Griffiths, he, he did a study on, on internet addiction and he found that technology itself, computers, social media, and or video games, it, they're not addictive, the technology in themselves. Rather that the person, in his study, he found that the person is lonely or trying to replace social connectedness with technology. In fact, two other Turkish researchers, Aykut and Kehan, they studied 559 Turkish university students. And they found that loneliness is the most significant link to problematic internet use. So that's kind of getting at your question that, you know, that we were having earlier about someone you know, not being able to get off their phone. It's, I mean, it's what we were saying last night too, that like teenagers are online, right, for connection, for inclusion, and for affirmation, and because they're bored. So if they don't have anywhere to go, if this is the only place that they can gather with their friends, if they're feeling lonely, they're gonna seem like they're addicted to media because they're gonna be there all the time because that's where they connect with other people and talk to their friends. Also, researchers Kim and Hari Dacus believe that the primary focuses of studies related to internet addiction should be motives for heavy internet use and background characteristics of users that may make them more prone to addictive behavior rather than studying the technologies themselves. Um, so I want to point out that the word addiction is a very serious word. When we use it too often to describe what youth are doing, as we do, I think, with social media, um, youth have a hard time understanding when they're actually suffering from an addiction and need help. If we say all the time, you're addicted to that, you're addicted to this, and I'm addicted, you know, it's a very serious thing to be actually addicted to something. And so if we use the word too casually, we may not be able to help teens discern when they actually have a legitimate addiction to a substance or something else in their lives. Um, some teens may, be, in fact, be addicted to the way the internet makes them feel, or they may use it in problematic ways, but I, I just want to caution us um, from using that word casually in our ministries especially, and in the organizations that we work in. Lynn Babb is an author and a pastor um, who writes about media, and actually her chapter 
um, from the book Digital Religion, Social Media, and Culture is on your flash drive. Um, Bab asserts the internet has become familiar to many people because of the time that they spend there and because relationships are experienced on the internet. Bab writes, the internet is a place where for many people, identity is formed, memory is structured, and attitudes are determined. Because as we said yesterday, the internet, this social media space is an extension of our in-person lives, an extension of our in-person relationships, so it affects our identity formation. Bab then emphasizes that for good or for ill, the internet the internet functions like a place for many people, and therefore theological reflection about God's presence in human places can be extended to consideration of the internet. And so we ask tonight, what is God up to in this place that we call social media? Nancy Bam is a principal researcher at Microsoft. Bam identifies five qualities found in both online groups and many other definitions of community that she thinks makes the term resonate for online context. So these five characteristics of community are the sense of space, shared practice, shared resources and support, shared identities, and interpersonal relationships. Therefore, for many teens and adults, BAM would say that the internet functions like a community. So you hear we saying it functions like a place for people where they're, and, and it's a place where their identity is formed. It's an extension of their lives. And then also Bam is saying here, for many people it functions like a community because it has these attributes. Last night we discussed anxiety, bullying, and low self-esteem. Tonight we are discussing three more possible inhibitors of joy in adolescence that have been hinted at already. Loneliness, exclusion, and feelings of being unheard. Henry Nouwen is one of my favorite authors of all time. Some of you may also love Henry Nouwen's work. Um, he's just an incredible pastor to pastors, especially. So if you're a Christian leader, um, I think he just it will pour into your life. He's incredible. He passed away in 1996 but it left an extraordinary legacy. This is a book called Seeds of Hope. It's um, a compilation of multiple writings that he did. And, and uh, this is what he uh, now and says about loneliness in his book, Reaching Out. Loneliness is one of the most universal sources of human suffering today. Psychiatrists and clinical psychologists speak about it as the most frequently expressed complaint and the root not only of an increasing number of suicides, but also of alcoholism, drug use, different psychosomatic symptoms such as headaches and stomach and low back pains, and of a large number of traffic incidents. Children, adolescents, adults, and older people are in growing degrees exposed to the contagious disease of loneliness. In a world in which a competitive individualism tries to reconcile itself with a culture that speaks about togetherness, unity, and community as the ideals to strive for. But the roots of loneliness are very deep and cannot be touched by optimistic advertisement, substitute love images, or social togetherness. They find their food in the suspicion that there is no one who cares and offers love without conditions and no place where we can be vulnerable without being used. Combating loneliness, now and is pointing towards, it's about helping youth to believe that they are cared for and loved without condition, and creating space for youth to be vulnerable without using them. I think too often in, in churches, I don't know, you know, other organizations, maybe not as much, but in churches especially, we can make youth kind of the token person in the room really easily. Um, and because of that, it can, be, it can feel like they're being used by the church sometimes. Um, we discussed last night, based on the book, Joy and Human Flourishing, that joy should be exercised in community, and that joy often arises out of, a deep, uh, out of deep interpersonal connections, and it arises out of the experiences of being loved and loving other people. And so that is our work as people who care about youth, 
It's about cultivating deep interpersonal connections with youth and creating space for youth to experience loving God and others and being loved without condition. Youth are also often excluded and unheard, um, especially in churches, I would argue. There is the occasional Youth Sunday once a year when youth are put up front and congregants listen to them. You laugh because you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but even then, the program is often designed by an adult and they just fill in the various roles that this, this framework of this adult that, that's been created. Um, too often, I think youth are unheard at meetings. They're not included in the decision-making of churches. Uh, too often, youth are an afterthought. And then we wonder why, after high school, they leave the church. If they are not taught to be full participants as youth in the church, they will not be full participants as adults in the church, even if they go there on Sundays, even if they're in attendance. If they don't ever learn to be a full participant, they never will. So have a discussion at your table. Have the teens you work with expressed that they are lonely, excluded, or feel unheard? If so, what, what have you heard from them? And do you think your organization does a good job of listening to teenagers?
Okay. So thank you so much for talking together. Um, we're gonna move. We're, we're moving. We're moving quick tonight because I want to give you another opportunity to talk in, in a little bit and to really dream about your own organization that you work for and, li and listen to each other um, and dream together tonight. And so we're gonna m continue on here. I hope that you've had some good discussion about these questions together. Tonight we are discussing ways to use social media to engage, listen to and build community with youth. We are discussing how social media engagement can contribute to youth leading and experiencing joyful, flourishing lives. So again, the qualities of community are a sense of space, shared practice, shared resources and support, shared identities, and interpersonal relationships. These are the attributes of a great youth group, actually. So if you have these things going on, think about youth ministry, think about working with teens in this sense of creating those sorts of shared things together. Um, social media engagement creates ample opportunities to do these very things. First, the internet is an incredible way to invite other voices into the room. I think the world needs a pep talk. I need you to look, people. Look with your eyes. This is where we live. It's a good place. Look around you. What do you see? Volcanoes, sunsets, just in Timberlake's teeth. Those things are perfect. But I'm telling you, world, we got some work to do. Open your eyes. How cool is it that we're all alive on the same planet at the same time? I think it's time that we start making cool stuff happen. On the planet we live on, there's poverty, hunger, injustice. The world is full of awesome. It's also full of not awesome. On the planet we live on, there's also potential possibilities. Puppies. Yeah, I said puppies. Ah, I'm getting distracted. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we're all here. We're all going to make a difference. It can be easy to get overwhelmed. Feel like you can't do anything. But that's why we have each other. Yeah, there's lots of bad stuff in the world, but there's also you. And there's me. Time to set some goals. I'm not talking squad goals. I'm talking global goals. All of y'all, the whole world, is my squad goal. What the world needs is love, and also an end to extreme poverty, eliminating inequality, fixing our planet. That's why we got you. That's why we have each other. That's why we got goals, global goals. Together, we're louder. Together, we're brighter. Together, we're gooder. That isn't a word. Global goal number four, education. Talk about school, I gotta tell you something. School cafeterias can be scary places. Where do I sit, where do I not sit, where's the cool table? Let me tell you something. The cool table is wherever you are. In the lunchroom of the world, there should be a cool table. Nope. The whole lunchroom should be one big cool table. A big table. A table where everybody's invited. Where everybody has a seat. Where everybody has enough. That's the kind of table that I want to be at. That's the kind of world I want to live in. That's the kind of world that we're building. Because of people like you. Yeah, you. I'm talking to you. Let's live in a world where awesome is celebrated every day. Where people treat people like they're people. Those are my kind of people. So get out there. And if you find yourself feeling like it's too tough, remember, you're not alone. There's lots of people at the table. And it's a cool table. Open your eyes. You'll see. <laughs> If you don't know about Kid President, you know, if you ever need a smile on your face, you need a little, you need a pep talk, he got plenty of pep talks for you. If you're a mom in the room, he has an incredible video dedicated just to moms. Kid President is amazing. Um, the internet, I propose, is a meaningful way for churches, not just youth groups, and for any organization to invite new or different perspectives and, cultural, and cultivate transformative learning. Since many organizations, especially churches, are homogenous, everybody's the same, but the internet creates this incredible opportunity for us to invite other people into the room who don't look like us, who don't talk like us, who have different stories than we have, who live in countries across the world, and you can do it by finding their information on the web. You can share tweets and blogs and videos from YouTube or TED Talks, art, images from people around the world. So I think it's an incredible way to invite other perspectives into your organization, into your teaching by inviting, and this is a young child that's speaking into all of our lives tonight, right? It's a way to invite someone in the room that's not here, but he's here with us tonight. 
Um, next, I think that it is critical for churches, schools, and other organizations to have conversations about social media before you just start using it. So these conversations, I think, can be aimed toward understanding the kinds of social media that, especially if you're working with youth, that they engage and why. When you discover the ways that social media is already being engaged among youth, it is easier for you to make decisions about the kinds of social media you should use to connect with youth in your ministry. To be able to invite them to youth group and create, you know, there's no point in creating a Facebook page if no one's ever going to look at it, is my point. You know what I mean? So there's no point in emailing all of your teenagers if they don't like email. So find out what they use and how, and, by, and say to them, what social media accounts do you check on a regular basis? How do I connect with you to give you information and invite you to stuff? What's the best way to, to connect with you? You know, and, and, and connect with them in those ways. Um, also, um, I know of certain, a, a church that uses an online worship platform um, to help people to sign up to participate in services and to help design worship services. Because people are so busy in the world today, because people have so many commitments, this online worship planning center is a great way. People have logins. They can log in and say, oh, I can play the guitar on this Sunday. They have a, a, they have the, it's kind of like an Excel sheet on there, but it looks, it looks like that. But basically, you can sign up to play an instrument, sing a song, or I want to do a creative piece on this night or something. So an online planning site is a great way to invite youth to participate in youth groups as well down the line. Um, possibilities of questions for discussion, this kind of conversation that I'm encouraging, encouraging churches to have is, um, how is social media being used by individuals in this organization? And then, how is social media being used by various ministries or departments within our organization? Um, are we all doing, like, do we have, like, five Facebook pages? Are we working together here? Does one ministry have a lot of things going on, and then this one doesn't have it all? How do we integrate our social media together? And if we have nothing, what do we start? Maybe we start with our congregants and what they're using and start there. And then also asking, how can social media be used and this is for churches particularly, for congregational, spiritual, and missional formation. The church tri um, triad is what my mentor calls it um, in his book, uh, Churches, Cultures, and Leadership. Basically, congregational formation is how do we attend to each other in a church? Spiritual formation, how do we attend to God? Missional formation, how do we attend to our neighbors and to the community, the neighborhood around our church? And so we need to ask that question, how can we use social media to attend to each other, to attend to God, and to attend to our neighborhood and the community in the world. Um, regarding congregational formation, um, or in, this, uh, in the case of a nonprofit, person-to-person uh, -person relationships within the organization, social media can be used to maintain relationships with youth during the week if you know, the right parameters are set up in either organization um, or if, it, if it's allowed. Um, it can be help, you know, it's very helpful when you haven't seen a youth, obviously, to be able to reach out to them, and it's an easy, you know, non-confrontational way to say, how are you doing? I'm thinking about you. Um, and, you know, um, another, another thing is that you can kind of see what youth are, are up to during the week and check in on them. Um, most of my examples tonight of things that I've done are related to youth groups and churches, because that's my work has been for the last 14 years in churches and as a youth pastor. Um, however, I hope that you'll be thinking of how to translate what I'm saying to any context related to caring for youth if you are representing another type of organization here tonight. Um, but one example, my youth and I, um, after youth group, we had a running Facebook messaging thread. And so usually I would start it on Sunday night after youth group or on Monday morning, um, kind of like, you know, based on what had happened the night before, um, and I would send the message, you know, it's a private thing just between, um, a Facebook message is just between you and a group of people or you, you and another person. And we would just have a running thread between youth groups. <laughs> and sometimes it would just be like, you'd get on there and you'd be like, whoa, people have said so much stuff to each other. But um, it was much better than like, than having a Facebook page. None of them would have ever posted there. But they loved that we had like this secret message thing that no one, any, you know, no one else could see. But, and actually no other youth leaders were on it either, but it was just me and all the youth. And they would say a lot of stuff. They'd say what they were doing. They'd share pictures, all this kind of stuff. And it was kind of a running way to stay connected with each other. That was fun. Um, another way to, to connect with youth outside of regular gatherings is to have a group hashtag, which is what we've been encouraging, you know, this week is to have, um, you can create a hashtag. It's not like 
you know, you don't have to pay for it, it's not a secret or anything like that. You literally can just create a hashtag and when people use it, then it's searchable and you can find the content that's related to it. And it could be pictures, I mean, it could be like, so the same hashtag could be used on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and it would all, you could like look at the content related to that hashtag on any account. And so my youth group and I, um, we created the hashtag, um, obviously, because it was sexy PMC youth group hair. That's what they chose, yeah. I worked at Pasadena Mennonite Church um, in Pasadena, California, and uh, that's what they chose. It's very long and annoying to have to type that out all the time, but um, that's what they chose, and it was hilarious and fun, and it was like a thing between all of us and our youth leaders, and that's what they used whenever they posted what they were doing, what they were up to. I know uh, I studied two churches for my dissertation, um, and one of them used social media all the time to engage millennials at a church in D.C., and they have a hashtag, and they use it all the time, and congregants use it um, throughout the week um, to kind of say where they are and what they're doing, and other congregants will look at, well, they told me, these millennials, because they have about 200 millennials that go to their church, so I wanted to study them, and I was like, they said that these millennials told me that they will, they will get online after work, search the hashtag that they have for their church, and then go, oh, they're gathering at this place to play music, I'm gonna go over there. Oh, some people are grabbing you know, food and beverages at this place, I'm gonna go over there after work. And so it's a way to connect people throughout the week without having to like, set up appointments and whatnot. Um, social media can also be used as a teaching tool, obviously. Um, before people, though, come to church, or class, or to an organization of sorts. So social media is a great way to share content with people so that they are prepared to engage you in discussion um, and ready. So for example, I know of a church that uses, um, sends their choir members YouTube videos of the songs that they're going to practice in choir, you know, before they come to choir practice, which is great, you know, because if, everybody, if people have emails, all they have to do is you send them the links to YouTube videos. If they have an email account, they click on the links of the videos, they can watch the songs, YouTube pretty much has any song ever, and they can kind of get a, a feel for what the song's gonna be like, and they're a little bit more prepared before the, when they come to choir practice to be singing it together. Especially those people that take a little bit longer maybe to learn new songs. Um, so you can use social media to prepare students, youth, people in your churches, in your organizations, to be ready to come to a conversation at the table together. Also, social media can be used for prayer. Um, you can have a special um, hashtag maybe in your church just for prayer requests. And so then that way the staff can, um, or the prayer team um, could, that comes together, they could look it up on social media, the hashtag that you have especially for prayer requests, and then pray for the things that have been mentioned there. Um, you could also have an email for that if you want to make it more personal or something like that, but um, that's a great way to gather prayer requests um, instead of just having to write it on a card on Sunday morning if something happens throughout the week. Um, you can also, as far as prayer, invite youth to check out Facebook or Twitter feeds to see what's trending and what's happening in the world during youth group. And then you can use the content that they find online to pray. So you can even teach them, so you, you're, you're sitting around with them, I've done it in social media classes too, and say everybody open up your iPhones or your, you know, whatever you have around you and um, let's see what's going on in the world. Let's see what's trending on Facebook. Let's see what's happening on Twitter. And then they tell, they, we talk about the current events, what's happening, um, what's in the news, and then we pray for people. And what's great about this is this is, this is not only the practice of prayer using you know, current events and everything like that, but it's teaching youth to be reflective about their social media use. So just when I, when I see something really bad happening to someone out there somewhere, if I've been taught at youth group that maybe I should pray for that person, you know, this is not just news that I, you know, throw away, but I actually stop and I reflect about what the, what's happening to this other person. It personalizes people in other, spa you know, spheres, which, as the bullying thing we were saying, it's very easy for people to separate and to say it's somewhere out there, even if it's very much a real place in many of us in our lives. So prayer, um, praying for people through what you find on the internet um, personalizes um, social media as a space that's real in people's lives. Um, social media can also be used for missional engagement. You can teach youth to use social media to advocate, to advocate for social justice causes. Um, you can invite youth to research current events, 
um, like during youth group uh, or in, during your class or whatever, you know, whatever you're leading with youth, you can invite them to research current events related to human rights issues, uh, creation care, things that are going on um, you know, in other communities that you want them to care about and they can learn what is happening and then maybe present to one another what they've learned and then as a youth group you can discuss ways to respond to what they've found online. Again, that's another way to teach them to be really reflective about what they find online and to it teach them what's good information and what's bad information. Um, you can also use social, social media for celebration and lament. Um, a dear church member um, at Pasadena Mennonite Church and a brother in Christ passed away last week. Um, and his funeral was this past Saturday. And he has four children between 11 and 19 years old. And he, he passed away of cancer. He'd been battling cancer for about a decade. But to see what people um, did because of social media in, in the wake of his death was really extraordinary. His children, um, his two, uh, three of them teenagers, in the week before his death, after hospice came, his children asked people to post stories and memories about him on his Facebook page. And they said that they were gonna read the stories and the memories to him aloud. And they did, they all sat on his bed and they read stuff to him that people had posted on his Facebook page about him. An extraordinary way to honor Dr. Scott Cameron, um, a dear friend of mine. Facebook and Instagram can also be ways to celebrate your youth. You can post videos of you speaking words of encouragement and celebration to them, even if you look like a nut. You know, you can post little videos, you can text some videos like, hey, I love you, hope you're happy Monday, I hope you're doing good. You know, um, you can write posts about why they are really awesome. Um, you can post pictures of you and them on their wall, obviously on their birthday or other special occasions. Kind of go the extra mile with your posts. And really, it's, it's so crazy how a post can go a really long way. Because what we were saying yesterday, they're on social media for affirmation, right? They want affirmation. And so when you provide that as a youth leader, it also demonstrates what it is to affirm other people online. Um, these are very simple ways to help youth to feel included and connected and affirmed. Social media can also be a way of teaching youth discipleship. We can teach youth how to listen and be present with others and be hospitable to others online as a way of representing Jesus. And so you can talk to them, but when you talk to them about presence, when you talk to them about listening, the importance of hospitality, these biblical principles, you can talk about it in terms of both in person and online. There are also imaginative ways that churches can use social media beyond creating a Facebook page to disseminate information, which is what most churches are doing. Um, they're just giving information to congregants, but they're not really creating ways for congregants to give information back to the church. And remember I was saying last night that Web 2.0, the coolest thing about it is that you can't just download information, you can upload information. It's a tool that is bi-directional and multi-directional because you can share information in multiple ways, I mean, in, uh, to multiple people at once. And so the churches, I think, really need to, and other organizations, to um, embrace the multi-directional nature of the internet. And instead of just having a page that gives people information, they need to set up ways for congregants to give information back to the church. Churches um, can create storytelling uh, spaces online. Congregants can be encouraged to tell and listen to their stories, um, to, to the stories in online forums, or share their blogs with one another. Um, this, you know, stories, testimony. So what is God doing in your life this week? And you could have people post videos of themselves. It's very easy to take a video with your iPhone now, a smartphone, um, or some, you know, somebody else's smartphone that you're borrowing. And you can upload your story and then a staff member could go through and go, oh man, this story like, needs to be shared on this Sunday morning. That's so extraordinary. And it gives you content to then, you know, and you're allowing congregants to participate in interesting ways. Um, and, or, and youth, for youth groups. Uh, groups of congregants can also watch films or YouTube videos or TED Talks that you share with them, and then that it, or maybe that have been chosen together, and then they can get online to talk about these things with you. So this is a way of extending youth group or gatherings with youth is saying, hey, we're all gonna watch this film and then post, like, tell me what you think about this film in this forum that we've created. Um, also, you can do the same with Bible, like a Bible study or book studies. Um, 
and you could have everybody read the same thing and then go to this place to post their reflections on it if they want to. Um, obviously, these are the things that you have to really discern with your youth. Like, would they like a storytelling place? Would they like, you know, a Bible study, a book study of some sort? Would they like to watch a film together? Would they enjoy this TED Talk kind of, or this YouTube clips? Or maybe you ask them, what kind of content would you want to discuss together? Um, online, you know, and you can do it asynchronously or synchronously, so you can get online at the same time and talk to each other about the film you just watched or the book or something, or you can just set up a forum that people can get on whenever they want to and share their thoughts. Um, in my national survey, I discovered that many U.S. congregants are actually open to creating content online together. Um, like, a lot of people said, yeah, I'd love to create content online. So youth leaders or pastors can encourage youth and other congregants to use social media to create presentations, videos, and art, and then circulate what they create within the, the congregation. And this is a way of helping youth to feel heard. So you say to them, you know, you create something online, and they can do some extraordinary things, some of these youth. And then you say, you share, if you create something, share it with me, or if you discover that they've created something, maybe share it with the congregation. Maybe it doesn't have to be during a worship service, but maybe you have a space where you say, oh yeah, this youth did this really cool, you know, spoken word thing, like you should go check it out, um, or something like that. In my youth group, I created, um, at the time, vines were really cool. And I did a, a thing, I'm gonna tell you what a vine is, and I'm gonna show you one in a second, if you're not sure, but um, I did vines with a purpose. So I would give them like, you know, a thing, a topic that they had to make their video about, and then they would create vines, and then they would text me their vines, um, or email them to me, or whatever, before youth group, and then I would show them at the beginning of youth group before, as part of our discussion, their cool vines that they did. And so video, vines are basically short video clips that are kind of all linked together to make one short video. And so here's an example. And I asked Maddie if I could share that. I texted her earlier and she said, yes, Angel, you can share this vine. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can, I mean, vines are just very funny. They're like little clips that you do like one at a time and then you link them all together to make a video and everything like that. But what's so crazy is that you give youth, you know, a, a topic and you say, create vines around this topic. It's extraordinary what they will produce. And then it becomes your opener. You don't even have to do anything. They've done it for you. You just show a bunch of vines and everyone's laughing and connecting or going, oh, that's so cool, you know? And then you go right into the topic and discussion about it. Um, you know, this was in like 2012, and so I can't remember, to be honest. <laughs> I thought about it, I was like, I, I didn't, I, I got a new computer, and I'm not, I know, I was like, I don't even remember what the purpose was, but it was, it was from 2012. <laughs> but it was awesome. <laughs> But Maddie's 19 and she's a sophomore at Bethel College now, so. Um, but, uh, sorry, I was in the, in the groove there. I'm, uh, okay, so, next slide. I'm gonna show you the, the book, Joy and Human Flourishing, which I kept talking about. I also commend it to you because many extraordinary people uh, wrote in this book, including our own, um, the, the, the founder of the center, Yale Center for Faith and Culture, Miroslav Volf. Um, Joy in Human Flourishing points out that pastors are often trained to be pain specialists because the majority of our work is focused on crises, such as illness, trauma, loss and grief, psychiatric illness, interpersonal violence, and disaster relief. And I want to say that, that this is important work. Absolutely, this is very important work. And obviously, we're talking about inhibitors of joy this week. I mean, you know, Sarah's going to talk about trauma on Friday night. And I talked about some hard things last night. Um, but what this, this person, this writer is saying is that too often pastors are unaccustomed, untrained, and perhaps unable to care helpfully for people who are longing for the fullness of healing, hope, joy, strength, or well-being. These experiences need nurture and care as well, so that persons and communities can flourish and practice the love of God and neighbor with vitality and zest. Therefore, she says, just as pastoral counseling offers persons the opportunity to plumb to the depths of their sorrows, pastoral counseling ought to be an offering persons the opportunity to explore the heights and breadth of their experiences of grace, strength, goodness, beauty, and joy. Experiences of joy, when explored more fully, 
offer avenues for a deeper understanding of God's goodness and love. And so I really believe that social media can be used to explore youth's experiences of joy. Um, you could discuss joy with youth and then ask them to take photos throughout the week of moments when they feel joy. They could bring you their photo, the photos to the next youth group and you could put them into small groups or in a large group and have them share, depending on how large your group is, what they took pictures of and why they associate these images with joy. Another idea is to have them create a mashup or an iMovie of what they have learned in youth group recently. Like, so you do a series on joy, well, create a mashup or create an iMovie or you know, something like that dedicated to what you've learned in youth group. And then say, in the next youth group, we're going to share the stuff that you've learned. Um, here's an example of a mashup. Hello. Hello. Is it me you looking for? So a mashup is just uh, usually, you know, it's content from various places, especially music, that are mashed together. People create it. Um, it could be really interesting what your students create when you say to them, what have you learned in youth group? Let's create it. Let's create a response to what you've learned and then maybe share it on your social media accounts. Um, and uh, I also have some of my students, my seminary students, they, ha they, they will create stuff given what they've learned, like haikus poetry, different things, you know, and then share it in response to what they've learned. Um, in my youth group, I invited youth to post Instagram photos integrated with a central theme and a biblical text um, with our youth group hashtag before youth group as well. So just like the vines of the purpose, I also would have them sometimes, you know, take a photo, like so that we are going to talk about this biblical text or this theme, take a photo and post it on Instagram, put our hashtag, and then we're going to, you know, I'll look at some of them before youth group and cultivate conversation around what you've chosen and why you think it matters. How does this, how does this image relate to this biblical text? Um, we're a very image-driven culture today, so it's a, very, it's, a, it's a great way to get teens talking um, is through images. They could also create a meme um, and do the same thing, so a meme related to a biblical text. A meme is an image with words over it, like this. So Jeremiah 29.11 is all about you. Remind me again about your time in the Babylonian exile. <laughs> that um, is, <laughs> that's for I know the plans I have for you, that, that text. Um, so that's a meme joking around about that text. Um, so teens could take a biblical text, create a meme about it. There's actually a website um, dedicated to meme generating. So I think meme generator, you can just Google that. Then there's an app too, and you can do it for free. It'll give you images, and you can put words over it, and it generates it. Yeah, it's awesome. So it's very, very simple um, for them to do that. Um, it's a creative way to get them to put images and words together and to be concise and comprehensive, which are really important um, things to be able to do for reflection, teaches people reflection. Um, so another idea is to have youth offer videos for the church to watch together. I was saying this kind of a minute ago, um, to use them as a basis of discussion at church. So this could be for the larger church or for youth group. Um, for example, every few months with my teens, I would text them and I would say, tell me what song or songs you're listening to on repeat right now. Like you can't stop listening to it. And they would all like give me that, you know, and I'd make a list. And some of them, it would be like, there'd be a really popular song, like Imagine Dragons, you know, Demons or something like that. And so they're all listening to it at the same time. And what I would do is I would um, create a list of songs that I was going to use in youth group over the coming months. And we would have a moment every Sunday night, and they really loved this, where I would choose one of their songs and I would play the YouTube video from the song. I always checked it out beforehand because sometimes it was like, the, the video could be a little sketchy. So you just have to, you have to watch it beforehand, see what the videos are like, but also um, the questions that we ask get at that as well. So, and then I would also find the lyrics to the song. And I would play these songs, and many of them, you know, not songs that were intended to be about God or about religion or Christianity or anything. And I would ask them, um, we, would, we would watch the music video, then I would put up the lyrics, and I would, we would always ask the same three questions. So who, who chose this song, and why did this song resonate with you? Why do you like it? And then they would share. 
And then the second question is, what is true about these lyrics? Is there truth here? And then the third question we would ask is, what is untrue? In what ways do these lyrics lie about the way the world really is, or the way it works, or the things that God has told us about ourselves? So for example, pit bulls give me everything tonight. <laughs> we examined that song and we said, is that really, is that the way the world works? Give me everything tonight and let's just not worry about it tomorrow? It doesn't really matter? Is that real life? And, and it would create really interesting conversation about, and what this does, again, is teaches teens to be reflective about the media that they engage. And they heard me say it so often that what you put into your heart and into your mind, it matters. And so you want to continually reflect, and what am I putting into my mind? What am I putting into my heart? Because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? You know, so we want to think about what we put into our hearts and into our minds. And this every week, and they loved it because it was like stuff that they'd show. They were participating. And it, was, it generated really interesting discussion. Um, now it's your turn again. I would love you all to discuss together what are imaginative ways that you use social media in your organizations. I hope we can learn from each other tonight. So I've given you a lot of ways that I've used social media in ministry and in education um, and to help people to be more, more reflective about their, their media use, which is what it's called media literacy. So I've, I've talked about that tonight. What are imaginative ways that you use social media in your organizations? And then also, what are some imaginative ways that your organization could use social media, given what you've heard tonight? Let's, be, let's engage our imaginations for about 20 minutes. I want you to write down the stuff that you come up with together, and we're going to hear from you tonight.
to help me put this in here. Just tuck it in there. Yeah. All right. Um, someday, and I'm really saying this on live stream because I really am praying that this happens. Somebody needs to create a microphone that women who teach and preach can wear, okay? Because you have to have somewhere to put the thing, okay? So amen, right? Yeah. So somebody out there somewhere, please create a microphone. You're going to make a lot of money that women could easily wear. Because there, there are some, I think, that are wireless, but they're very expensive. So we just we need a solution for this, people. This is Yale, and I'm having to do this. People are going to have to help me, okay? Um, I just got a text, very important text, from my mom. Mom, thanks for watching. I'm so glad. <laughs> she said, yeah. Um, my mom and my, my stepdad, Don, Don, hello, um, they're watching from Eddyville, Kentucky, and um, they're very excited. And she's like, we have you up on the TV and everything. <laughs> That's the beauty of media, people. You can have your mom in the room, even though she's in Kentucky and very far away. Um, and isn't it the truth, like, no matter how old you get, your mom's, like, your biggest fan? She's just, like, rooting you on, just like, yeah. <laughs> Yay for moms. Okay, so, and for dads, for great people in your lives that invest in you. Um, like all of you who do that for young people, um, I'd love to hear some of your ideas. We don't have a lot of time, but um, would a few tables like to share um, just some of your thoughts? What are some ways that you're currently using social media and imaginative ways to connect with youth? Um, how have you been perhaps inspired tonight? Oh, this woman right here. Oh, she's fiery. I love this one. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah? I speak loudly yeah. from the diaphragm. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! From the diaphragm. Um, so we kind of went backwards, but um, what we do actually is um, one of our folks here created a playlist for confirmation. So it's sort of like an ongoing year long, let's see what songs you like and all of that. Christian, Christian playlist. Sorry about that. Um, we all agreed that we have bland Facebook pages. I think we're, we're all in agreement of that, and websites. Um, that um, one of, the church where I'm going on Facebook does not have a page. It has a conversation. That's what they call it. And it made a huge difference in the way folks interact with it. Just that one little thing. And then their choir receives uh, YouTube videos for practicing. Ooh. And then some ideas, uh, digital bulletin boards, one church, uh, they currently get a devotional emailed to them, but to have that be interactive instead of passive. Um, asking youth to help with the technology in the church. Um, these folks have a, a big old screen, and all it has is meeting times on it. So youth could put up some videos or something. Um, having a sermon talkback page. Um, and then one good idea, too, was having like a a weekly lectionary meeting electronically that anyone can contribute to that would then give the pastor seeds for their sermon. So then the youth could actually be part of the pastor's sermon. So oh, thanks. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, one thing you said made me think um, also uh, uh, pastors in the room, youth leaders in the room, you could also film yourself sharing something, and then have people come to the room to talk about what you've already shared. Um, it's kind of doing a flipped classroom kind of thing for the, your organization. You know, so you prep people, like I was saying, with the content, and then they, they spend the time together actually discussing, asking questions, thinking about it, reflecting together on it. Um, other ideas that, some, that people would like to share? I'm coming. Thank you. An imaginative idea that I have is I've come to realize I need a youth tutor. I, I want to um, hire a young person to teach me how to use social media. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, a lot of ideas that we were given tonight. But I have to learn how to do a mash and how to do all the other ones. And so, but my particular objective would be to find this um, young person, um, this youth tutor, and let them know I want them to teach me how to use social media to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ.
Thank you. This one's right here. Um, we had two things, uh, two ideas here that uh, weren't mentioned yet. Um, one of the churches here uses YouTube to share their choir's videos every Sunday. And another church uses live stream, um, they live stream their Sunday service so they could see it in the community colleges, all the college kids could see it in the community. Um, this gentleman's uh, church hires somebody to train the congregation on how to use social media. Um, so we did Snapchat challenges. I know, and I know, so for college students, Snapchat is fun, especially to make memes and stuff like that. So doing like a Snapchat scavenger hunt, and then you could check the scavenger hunt through the Snapchat. Um, and also things, Snapchat takeovers or group takeovers. So maybe the middle schoolers take over the Snapchat one night, or the high schoolers take over the Snapchat another night. Um, and also um, having student leadership, so having a com communications leader, um, a student that specifically runs the communications for that year would be really cool. Um, and accountability peers. So that's peers, instead of having an adult say, hey, like, why did you post this online? Or why are you saying these things? Having a person that's a peer to you talk to you about it, mm -hmm. which is more easygoing and it's not like you're being in trouble or getting in trouble or something like that. Mm -hmm. When you said, uh, the, you said after the scavenger hunts, you talked about a Snapchat, like they, a takeover. Well, can you explain what you mean by that? So Snapchat takeover is when um, one group of students has the account for the night. So they take over the account saying like, have videos or oh. um, saying like, this is what the middle schoolers is doing. So kind of like a challenge, like high schoolers versus middle schoolers. And that's what. That's. Yes. Okay. Very cool. And that's another thing is that um, we would uh, do in our youth group is we would use, do scavenger hunts. We didn't do it with Snapchat um, a couple years ago. We would just do, have them take photos of stuff. Like, so you have to go and like, you know, uh, four people like next to a toilet in a stall together. That's like one of the pictures you have to take. You know, stuff, silly stuff. Like someone sitting on the, pul like on the pulpit. Things that are not supposed to happen, you know, but that are fun when no one's around to have them do. Um, so, but like scavenger hunt, so you're using media and it's really fun. It's a fun game, a way of using media. Um, so doing a scavenger hunt where you use the smartphones, so you give every group a smartphone and you give them a list of 10 pictures that they have to take and get back, who can get back to you with the 10 pictures taken the fastest. And, but it's like really, you have to make it, you know, so it's like four people doing the running man like in front of this thing, you know, and they have to, feel like, and sometimes it's, so if they have five people in the group, it's better to have shots that don't have everybody, you know? Um, and then, you know, so three people next to a toilet in one of the church, you know, like two people doing this, you know, whatever. And so you, a pyramid, and they have to set up the shot, you know, and stuff like that of your whole group. So stuff that will take them some time and teamwork to do, and they run back to you and we see, you know, but then you also can show the photos of what they just did. So it's a fun game that uses media. Other ideas? Well, um, I want to thank all of you again for being here tonight, um, and uh, I hope that you're going to come back tomorrow night because Sarah and I are going to talk about burnout in the gap. Sarah Farmer, my colleague um, sitting here, um, Sarah and I are going to team tag burnout in the gap. If you, um, if you do ministry, if you do hard work, please come back tomorrow night. We're going to talk to tomorrow night about burnout and compassion fatigue and ways to, to see those things. And if you're not particularly feeling those things, there may be people in your ministries who are feeling that way and you care for them. So also come on their behalf. I want to, we, do, we do want to close with this. Marianne Williamson, she said joy. Um, we're going to close with a couple things. So Marianne Williamson, she said that joy is our goal, our destiny. We cannot know who we are except in joy. Not knowing joy we do not know ourselves. And Neil Donald Walsh said, release the joy that is inside of another and you release the joy that is inside of you. Is that it for tonight? We have somebody of prayer? We have someone praying? Aracelis, are you praying tonight? To close us out? Are we full?